This video is about geometric sequences. So a geometric sequence, you can find each term by multiplying the previous term by a common ratio. So this time, instead of adding something each time, like in an arithmetic sequence, you'll be multiplying by a constant each time. Now, sometimes that constant is greater than 1, sometimes it's less than 1, which can be a little confusing. So here are three examples of geometric sequences. In the first one, it should be pretty obvious you're multiplying by 2 each time. In the next example, uh, it goes from whole numbers down to decimals that are less than 1. So you figure you're probably multiplying by a fraction. Um, in this case, you're multiplying by 1 half each time. It's best to think about it as multiplication. Don't think about it as division. Think about it as multiplying by 1 half rather than dividing by 2 each time. And then in the third example, whenever you have signs that alternate like that, first term positive, second term negative, third term positive, and so on, uh, that means that the common ratio is going to be a negative number. So here you're multiplying by negative 3 each time. You can always write a recursive definition for a geometric sequence simply by taking the previous term, which is u sub n minus 1, and multiplying it by the common ratio. So the other ones on this page would be um, u sub n minus 1 times a half and u sub n minus 1 times negative 3. The constant that is multiplied each time is called the common ratio, and we use the letter R. So here's the general form for the recursive definition of a geometric sequence. Um, not that useful unless you have the first term, and then you can build up the second term, third term, fourth term pretty easily. But if you wanted to do something like find the 50th term, again, recursive definitions are not that useful. Um, if you ever have a hard time finding the common difference, sorry, the common ratio um, just by looking at it, you could always set up a division problem to find it. So let's say you have a sequence like this and you can't figure out what R is, the common ratio. You can take any term and divide it by the term that comes before and you'll figure out what the common ratio is that way. So 3 divided by 6 shows us that our common ratio for this sequence is 1 half or 0 0.5 if you want to write it as a decimal. Uh, this is the much more useful definition. So geometric sequences can be explicitly defined. Here you can plug in n, which is any term that you want to find, and figure out what the value of that term is. So you could use this to find the 50th term or the 18th term or any term. Um, this is the one that's in the formula booklet that you're going to use a lot on IB exams. So let's put this one into use. It's u sub n equals u sub 1, which is the first term. Right? Remember that u sub 1 means the first term, okay? uh, times r to the power of n minus 1. And n could be any term that you're trying to find. And of course, r stands for the common ratio for the sequence. So here's an example, pretty simple. We're going to find the eighth term of this sequence. We could just keep going. We already have the first four terms. But I'm going to practice using the formula just to get in the habit of using it. Um, you want to identify, obviously, the first term if you have it. So the first term of this sequence is 24. And you want to identify r, which is the common ratio. So what's being multiplied by each term to get the next term? Well, our sequence is decreasing, so we're multiplying by a fraction. Uh, and in this case, we're multiplying by 1 half. So you're going to start by writing the formula that you want to use, which is the geometric sequence formula, and then fill in what you know. We're going to fill in u sub 1, which is 24. And we're going to fill in the r, which is 1 half. That's our common ratio. And now because it wants me to find the eighth term, that means n is 8. So 8 minus 1 becomes the exponent. When you're evaluating this, um, if you're using a calculator or if you're doing it mentally, you need to be careful that you're doing the exponent first. So you want to make sure you do 8 minus 1 first, and then 1 half to that power before you multiply by 24. So it would not be okay, okay to multiply the 24 by the 1 half and write 12 to the 7th power. That would be something extremely different. So you do not want to multiply before you do the exponent. Make sure you're doing the exponent first and then multiplying by u1. So in this case, it comes out to 3 over 16. That's the value of the eighth term, 3 16. Or you could express it as a decimal. Here are some examples from your textbook. Um, part A just says find the geometric sequence with a sub 1 equals 2 and r equals 3. So here they're using a sub 1 instead of u sub 1. Again, remember you can always use different letters to stand for the sequence. Um, we usually use U and in the formula booklet it's U, but you could use A or B or, or any other letter. So they're telling us that the first term is 2 and the common ratio is 3. So for part A, all we're really doing is finding the formula. So with this information and this formula, I'm going to fill in the first term, fill in the R, and then just leave the rest of it in terms of N, and that's the sequence. Um, if 
if you wanted to write it as a list, because it is a little bit unclear in part A what they're looking for, you could just start listing the sequence as well. So you could just write that two is the first term. And then since the common ratio is three, that means you're multiplying by three each time. So six would be the next term, multiply by three again, 18 would be the next term, multiply by three again, and so on. So you could also write it as a list because it's not quite clear what it's looking for in part A. In part B, it says, describe the sequence, blah, blah, blah. And I put a little note in red that says, Describe here means write the formula if you can and also explain what's happening in words. Since they want a description, it's good to have sentences to describe what's happening. Um, but if you can fill in a formula, that's always a good way of describing the sequence. So for part B, notice the first term is 3. The common ratio this time, so the number being multiplied, must be negative because I'm going from a positive to a negative value and then alternating back. And it looks like we're multiplying by 4 each time. So my answer to part B. Here's the sequence, here's the formula, all filled in. So three is the first term, the common ratio R is negative four. Notice I'm putting that negative four in parentheses, it's really important to do that, just because if you ever have to do something like negative four to the second power, that's extremely different from negative four in parentheses to the second power, and we wanna make sure we're using the one with parentheses, right? Because negative four to the second power without the parentheses would be a negative value, whereas negative four with the parentheses around it to the second power would be a positive value. I'm writing my description in sentences. It says the first term is three and each subsequent term is multiplied by the common ratio negative four, which is negative, and that's why the sign alternates. So I tried to pack in as much as I could into my description. Honestly, you could probably get away with writing less. For part C, it wants us to describe the sequence 1, 1 half, 1 fourth, 1 eighth, and so on. So first, I, um, write, I write the formula. I fill in the first term, which is 1, the common ratio, which is a half here. We're multiplying by a half each time. And then my description is that the first term is 1, and each subsequent term is multiplied by 1 half. Um, and then part D here, I didn't fill in. Um, it's not uh, that important in this chapter, but it's good practice. Um, when it says graph a sequence, um, basically I would create a table of values here. I'd plug in some different things for n and put treat n like x, the x-axis and treat your answer like the y-axis. And then you could just plot the points. Um, and you'd see that this one is going to create a kind of an exponential curve that looks like this. Um, but you've already done the chapter on exponential and log functions. That's more where this would get applied. Um, and we've already had that that lesson, so we don't need to really go back into that right now. But I would basically plug in one, plug in two, plug in three, plug in four, get some points, and then connect the dots. Um, this is an important example to cover. Sometimes there's ambiguity because R could be positive or negative. So if they don't give you R and you're asked to solve for it, um, if you get a positive and a negative answer, you need to give both. Even if it doesn't say find both values for the common ratio. So here's an example where they give us the second term which is 18, and they give us the fourth term, which is 8. And they don't give us the first term or the common ratio. They ask us to find them. They don't let us know or tip us off to the fact that there are actually two answers to this question. Um, so if that happens, you need to be prepared to just give both, even though it doesn't ask for two. It actually is asking for two. They just don't want to give anything away. So here's how we're going to do this one. This is like a system of equations. We did this with arithmetic sequences, so we're going to apply it to geometric as well. They give us not the first term, so they can't fill in u sub 1, um, but they give us the second term. So when the n value is 2, the value of the term is 18. So you can see I filled in the value of the term is 18 when n is 2. So that's the first equation I'm able to set up. The second equation I'm able to set up is that the value of the term is 8 when the n value is 4, because it tells us that the fourth term is 8. So I'm using u sub 1 for the first term since I don't know it, and I'm using r for the common ratio since I don't know that either. And now I have a system of equations to solve, um, two equations with two variables. Um, and there's a trick that you may never have practiced before because it's kind of unique to this. If you have two uh, equations like this, if I'm actually, I'm not going to add or subtract these together because I'm, I don't have any, it's just a little bit different. I don't have any addition or subtraction of different terms here. Um, instead, you're going to do a trick that involves dividing these two um, equations, which is kind of interesting. I'm actually going to take the first equation, sorry, the, the second equation, and divide it by the first one. So I'm going to write the second equation. I put a big fraction bar, and I put the, second, the first equation underneath it. 
So this is showing that I'm dividing each of these terms. I'm doing 8 divided by 18, u sub 1 divided by u sub 1, and then r to the third divided by r to the first. Why this is helpful is because u sub 1 divided by u sub 1 is 1, and that means that that term is actually going to go away. And what I'll be left with is 8 over 18, which of course simplifies to 4 over 9, and then r squared, because r to the third on top of an r like that, it means subtract the exponents and you get r squared. And now I have an equation with only r in it, and I can solve that by doing a square root. Now the square root of 4 over 9 is plus or minus 2 thirds. So this is where that um, common ratio could either be positive or negative, and we're not sure based on the information given. So we have to give both answers, which means to get the first term, which is the other thing it asks us to find, right, the common ratio in the first term, I'm actually going to have to plug in positive two-thirds and negative two-thirds. So this is a little and sign here because I have to solve this twice. I have to find once when r is positive two-thirds and once when r is negative two-thirds. So I plug it back in. I chose to plug it back into the first equation, but you can really plug it into either. And then when you solve each of these equations, in one, in one case, the first term is positive 27. In the other case, the first term would be negative 27. So depending on the first term, that's how you know which sequence you're dealing with, the one that has a positive two-thirds or a negative two-thirds. All right, and here's a final example of a geometric sequence um, built into a word problem. So in this uh, word problem, at 8 o'clock a.m., um, 1,000 milligrams of a medicine is given to a patient. At the end of each hour, the concentration is 60% of the amount present at the beginning of the hour. So this basically means the medication starts to wear off, right? It starts to disappear in your bloodstream um, over time. So it's 60% of the amount that you had at the start of the hour, at the end of the hour. And I give you a hint down here that says use the geometric sequence formula. Anytime you have something increasing or decreasing by a percent like this, this is a geometric sequence. And this is going to come up on tests and exams. So you really want to note that if you have something decreasing or increasing by a percent, that that's going to be a geometric sequence. OK? I'm writing with the mouse. So I'm going very slow, and the handwriting is not that neat. Um, so just note that, decreasing or increasing by a percent, you can use geometric sequence formula. First question says, what portion of the medicine remains at noon? Um, so at noon, we're talking about four hours later, we're basically looking for the fourth term of this sequence. So I'm going to use the formula. I know that the first term is 1,000 milligrams, because that's how much I started with, and the common ratio is 0 0.6, because that's what's getting multiplied by 1,000 each time in order to decrease the amount that's in your bloodstream. I'm plugging in 4 for my n value because I'm looking for the fourth term. And then I just evaluate it on the calculator, make sure I put units because we're talking about a word problem here. There's going to be 216 milligrams left. The second example, or it's part B here, uh, if a second dosage of 1,000 milligrams is administered at 10 a.m., so now you've got 1,000 at 8 a.m. and an additional 1,000 at 10 a.m., what is the total concentration at noon? So basically I just did this as two separate problems. I calculated the first 1,000 milligrams that you received at 8 o'clock in the morning, uh, which I already did in Part A. And then in Part B, I'm going to calculate the second 1,000 milligrams, which they give you at 10 o'clock in the morning. So if they give it to you at 10 and you're trying to figure out how much is left at noon, you're looking for the second term of the sequence. So I plugged it 1,000 in for my first term again, but this time I want to figure out the second term of the sequence, which would be 600. And then because you had the original dose plus the new dose, I added together the 216 that remains from dose 1 and the 600 that is there from dose 2, and I got 816 milligrams altogether. And that is all for this video.